Okay, welcome back everyone. Welcome guests. I think it's uh, rather unfortunate that you are sitting next to me, Greg. Because you're an exceptionally handsome man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I look good by contrast. Um, you the, the hand thing with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, some of the I heard thoughts. it was soft, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, my suggestion, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would be uh, to start in order of appearance. So let's tackle aliens first. Now we have quite a lot of questions, so probably we won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, but I would like to start off with, uh, with Kerry. Now, one of the things that we first need to do before we start thinking of alien civilizations is actually mm -hmm. finding them mm -hmm. and seeing them. Uh, now, there was a, a recent ar article in the Astrophysical Journal uh, that we are now capable of developing a laser that is powerful enough uh, to detect alien civilizations. Now, can, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, do we really have the capability and what are the specifics of such a laser? How powerful it should be? Uh, good question. So. I guess what this comes down to is if you want to look at things that are very, very far away, you need a way of transmitting information from one point to another in the quickest way possible. And the quickest way possible is by electromagnetic um, energy, waves, light, whatever. Um, so, so, so laser would be a good way to start the, the message from earth mm -hmm. in a pulsed form in a messaging form or whatever and then send it out and then i guess you'd you'd expect it might end up on a receiver mm -hmm. of a intelligent life form somewhere um, and then maybe they would be intelligent enough to send it back um, in terms of propagation of light how far it can go once it gets outside of the atmosphere it's on almost perfect vacuum so it's a really great um regional entity to pass light through without losing energy in the process. Your real challenge is going to be getting through the atmosphere and escaping the Earth's atmosphere in the first place because there's lots of particles in the way to absorb your laser. So what maybe you really want to do is mount a laser transmitter on um, International Space uh, shuttle or something. But I would assume that on the receiving end as well, if we have thick enough atmosphere, we won't be able to... Yeah, so really you want, you'd want your whole system, um, information sender and then receiver, to all be in space as well. Right. But that, yeah, that means you'd have to make sure everything's aligned and... Yeah. Okay, let's say that we, we get extremely lucky and we discover that there is an alien civilization out there. Now, when we speak about evolution, now, Matthew, you did say that, uh, you know, the rules of evolution... Uh, you know, are the same across the universe. So life will evolve in the same way that it has, it has evolved on Earth. So if we have an intelligent civilization, is it safe to assume that they will have a similar or close to our neural, uh, neuromorphology or the way no. that our, the brain is constructed? No, I, I see no reason to think that. If you <coughs> so the, what I was talking about was the, the constraints of, say, living in water. So there are particular... Um, uh, there are particular examples of convergent evolution where the environment has posed organisms the same problem and they've found a solution in a similar way. So you could think of the examples I showed about living in water or, for example, being large things that fly. Then wings are all kind of similar. I think in terms of intelligence, uh, I, I wouldn't know where to start about imagining that. So we know that uh, the only animals that can talk and have got the kind of sense of self that we were talking about earlier on, as far as we know, are ourselves. But other animals with slightly different brain morphologies, but they're still animals with brains, uh, like the crows can manipulate tools, uh, bees are very smart, they can have a concept of, of triangularity that you can teach them, there's an argument about how much they can count and so on. Uh, I but they're still animals with a brain. I think you could imagine, uh, so plants will respond to stimuli and there's an argument about whether they can learn or not. There's an international society of plant neuroscience. This is not a joke, this is a very serious mm -hmm. neuroscientists who study plants. So uh, you could imagine there are other ways of connecting information storing parts of the body to simply put it like that, it's effectively what the brain is, just gathering them all together um, and then processing it in a very different way. Right. So, uh, yeah, they could be like the aliens from Arrival, these big kind of octopoid things that are blobbing around and are speaking in pulses of, of colour. I think that's 
That's, why not? That's as unlikely, or it's probably less unlikely than them looking like us. I think that's, right. that's the most unlikely thing imaginable, uh, uh, unless they're a colony of humans that have been spirited away by alien abductors and put in on the planet Zuton and turn out to be the same. Right, that, right. that would have to be the explanation of that. Right. Uh, now, now, Greg, you don't study plants. You usually consume <laughs> them in, uh, in different ways. <laughs> how, how am I turning into this guy? <laughs> you know? You're a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I guess the question is, okay, if we, if we find an intelligent life form, it crashes on Earth, so we do a, a dissection of its brain, and it turns out that it has quite the same neuromorphology as ours. Now, by deconstructing the, 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 the biological structure, the way that the, the brain is built of this ali a a alien. Can we actually find a way uh, through by looking at the at the mechanics of uh, of their brain to understand what is the type of language or communication that we should be using in order to talk to them? Well, I mean, I think it's probably just easier to listen to it at first. Right. Yeah, yeah, then you kill it once you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so once it's dead, um, I guess, well, <laughs> I, if I were to be doing this, I guess I would be looking for any kind of sensory type organs that we might be able to collect information. If the thing is communicating telepathically, um, I would probably then look at what the mechanism of its neural system would be. Um, and as you know, was just stated, like the the brain could have nothing to do with what our brains are looking like. Um, but chances are it's, it's some kind of a structure that needs to, to communicate aspects about its environment in order to, like, into some central structure or even to different parts of the body so that it can react to its environment. Figuring out, you know, hopefully it communicates by some kind of mechanism which is manipulable either chemically or uh, through some kind of you know, electrostimulatory means mm -hmm. or through something that's like sound, I mean, who knows? It, it could be any number of things. Um, and usually, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, the way that neuroscientists tend to go at things is just by breaking them. So first you kill it, <laughs> and then you're you know, <laughs> looking to break the various systems to, s to see when their society falls apart because they can't communicate it anymore. <laughs> so anyway, like zeroing in on the structures which might be responsible for the communication I think would be the first type of step and then performing some kind of an analysis and, and hopefully having there be enough similarity that we can use some of the tools that we're used to using to, uh, to decipher some of the mechanisms. Right. So NASA's actually thought about this quite hard. So if you remember on the Voyager spaceships, we sent out two spaceships that are now outside the solar system. They've got these plaques on the outside uh, and on the inside there are records, including somebody who's saying that there's a Bulgarian song on one of these golden records that were sent out into outer space. And on the plaque, it's made of gold, and there's an image of the spaceship and a very discreet image of uh, a naked man and a woman. It's very 1970s, so <laughs> it's not entirely gen genetically accurate. Uh, this was America. But uh, this is in black on gold, but it's not only black, it's also... You it can be read electrically. So if the space aliens can't see but use some kind of electrical sense, then they will put their feelers onto this thing and they'll be able to sense the pattern of the images. So there are ways, if we wanted to communicate, of kind of you know, backing all sorts of different ways of communicating. Right. In, um, Go ahead. The science fiction uh, it contact, right? So that's written by Arthur Clark, Arthur C. Clarke. And he was thinking about how to do this. And, and the interesting thing I like about you know, the movie is kind of cheesy. It's a good movie, but uh, but they, the, the, the I think this was Carl Sagan, by the way. If you allow me to correct yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sagan. Yeah, so, sorry about that. But the even cheesier. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I love him, but hey, it's a good uh, it it's 70, a great seventies hair and everything. But um, the the <laughs> the, the sending of the so what signal would you send with your laser, right? So that's kind of the question. And what they he came up with, you know, it's, it's sending a se se sequence of prime numbers, because that sort of it's not random and it suggests this kind of quasi, or like maybe universal kind of, okay, only you know, intelligence would give you that sequence. A mm. And so from there, it doesn't really matter what their brains are arranged like or what their brains are made of. If they are doing something communicatory, some kind of, something like that, we can then begin to find a way, a pattern to communicate with them. And it's about the information we exchange, not about the particular evolutionary accidents that give us the receivers, but just the, the communication that matters. Um, right. you know, so I would, yeah, I would be in prime numbers with a yeah. super laser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
or just something non-random that can no, only no, be no. possible? Something, no, something no. Something better. you know yeah. about yeah. the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah. prime numbers says you, you've been thinking hard about yeah. maths since the ancient Greeks. They've been trying to figure this stuff mm. out. And do they ever end and why are they and all that? So yeah, yeah maths, I think, would be... Mm. But that's the language of the universe. But music is mathematical. Mm. Yeah, well, they put Chuck Berry and yeah. Bulgarian <laughs> songs yeah. on the record. So, you know. <laughs> Bird song. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Sheena, it's most plausible uh, to assume that it, uh, an alien species would probably be microbial, right? Mm. Uh, can we assume again, if uh, if we say that evolution works across the board the same the same way, uh, that that we already had you know alien alien species uh, on Earth, or probably in our in our guts? right now that we live in symbiosis uh, with, we're just unable to distinguish them because we co-evolved together. I guess the, uh, uh, the core of the question is, do we really understand all these 38 billions, uh, billion Trillion. bacteria that we have in, the, in our gut? No, <laughs> so that was very clear, we definitely don't understand. I think uh, this idea of they could be some kind of microorganism is a really interesting one, and, and that gives you, I guess, the potential for them to infect us. And that's certainly been the experience. You know, when, when humans went around and colonized other nations, we brought all sorts of contagions and wiped people out with measles and all sorts of other diseases that we kind of carried around with us. So could an alien species that, if it's a microorganism, do the same with us? Well, maybe, or maybe we would just be the completely wrong host for it. Some of the, the host pathogen relationships are so tightly evolved. I mean, one of my favorite parasites, I do have favorites, <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is a parasite called the schistosome. And it has a really complicated life cycle where it, it's, it has to infect a snail. And each species of schistosome is precisely adapted to infect one type of freshwater snail. It then emerges from the freshwater snail and kind of hangs around in the water like a little tiny umbrella, the microscopic one, waiting for its host, which might be us if we're the right type of species. And then it will continue to develop inside us. So what you've got is some amazing tight evolutionary bonds there. So how that kind of initial snail parasite thing happened, I don't know. And again, how that very precise, even how it finds the human host, we don't know. So I think the likelihood of them necessarily being in us is probably limited at the moment, I'll say. Limited at the moment. But, but I do remember <laughs> that the, uh, the big heroes in the movie War of the Worlds were exactly yeah. bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they killed them <coughs> off, they killed the aliens because they didn't have the immune yeah. response. Absolutely. Th this so wasn't this real. vice versa. This wasn't real, yeah. Yeah, I realized that. Again, a, a speculation. So, if we have a, a like mechanical uh, a civilization, so say they have evolved beyond, you know, working with protoplasm and uh, and, and all of that. Um, so, essentially, we're speaking about you know creatures that are, you know, robots or or something like that. So, from a philosophical standpoint, can we can we say that um, you know um, a, an AI or a mechanical entity can have the same self of self, uh, a sense of self? as we currently understand it? Well, right. To answer that question, we would have to understand consciousness and how we have a sense of self. And that is something we just don't understand right now so at all. So to then speculate as to whether machines can have that sense of self it's possible, and you know there is, and and Josh can speak uh, with uh, more expertise on this than I can. But there is computational theories of the mind that, w if those are right, then it would seem yes, these robots could uh, have the same. They could go through the same kinds of issues. You could have meditating robots, <laughs> but um, depressed ones. Yeah, <laughs> depressed. Uh, yeah, uh, tripping robots. All of it. Um, but, you know, there's just, we, we really don't know. We don't get consciousness right now at all, and we don't even have a clear, at least my read of the situation is, we don't have a clear sense of what that explanation would look like. So it's not even that, oh, we just need to do more science. We don't have the conceptual tools in place right now to, uh, to, to, think of how we could discover how that works and how it emerges. Right. 
I, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic about, about that more that philosophical question, but if you start with some of the things, that, you know, from the lower level, so a, a, a robot that needs to navigate an environment and has to monitor its own location relative to various things, you can think of how sort of various kinds of self-scanning mechanisms, and we already have in our, our phones and our computers, various kinds of self-scanning mechanisms in there, and, and, and things that allow, allow a system to, to track its own position relative to, uh, to other things, and then to predict what's going to happen when it does something. Um, so this kind of predictive element is very important for how we move, and, and there's a lot of interesting research about that. And there's no, I see no reason why at the level of a machine that certainly couldn't be implemented. Now the higher level stuff, uh, you know, the kind of self-reflective Des you know, Descartes stuff, there, yeah, it's m much more, I, I don't see why not, but yeah, we don't know enough, I think, about how we do it to know right. kind of what to, now of course, if you come across this robot, uh, let's say an, an alien lands and it's a robot, and you say to it, tell me about yourself. And it says, well, I think, therefore I am. I mean, you, you know, we have some, you know, maybe you, that would be evidence that it's doing this. Um, so I don't, I don't see why not. I like robots. I'm, I'm a <laughs> fan of robots. So. Right. Uh, now, there was an interesting question here when we speak about evolution and the, and the evolution of consciousness and the, and, and the self. Now, what do you guys think uh, about the theory of the stoned ape? Uh, that we co-evolved with these, uh, you know, psychedelic plants that we consumed on a regular basis, uh, basis, and this actually made us, uh, you know, sort of enhanced our our mental and cognitive evolution. Sounds yeah, like never, an right? idea you that somebody that? dreamed up when <laughs> yeah. they'd been uh, taking some interesting substances. I, I disagree. Okay. Well, no, actually, I agree, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that it's probably right to at least an extent because an idea only needs to evolve once, right? We were talking about this, that when you have an insight, for example, how to make fire, I'm not saying that that necessarily happened when, when an ape was tripping, but mm -hmm. that if there's, <laughs> and maybe it did, but if there's some kind of a combination, like a novel combination of ideas, which absolutely most definitely happens in the psychedelic state because you have communication in your brain which is not typically happening. A lot of that is bullshit, you know? There's a lot of noise that is meaningless that's happening in your brain at the time. And at the same time, the invention of the computer microchip was, uh, we came up with uh, under the influence of psychedelics. The polymerase chain reaction is another example, which I think I believe is under LSD. Um, there have been profound technological and philosophical insights with the use of these substances that, again, once that idea gets introduced into a culture, then it becomes kind of culturally genetic, or epigenetic would be the, the correct term for it. You, you have that idea passed down through a culture which can, um, so the evolution, how it affects the DNA and our genes, I think it's probably not concerned with that sort of thing, but the evolution of cultural ideas may have more promise you know, in that realm. I, I think I'd probably beg to differ, and there's a simpler explanation, and that is, which would root our interesting behavior in something you didn't quite mention in your, your discussion, uh, in our ecology, because that's, that's what explains everything ultimately, why species look the way they do and do what they do, and that's their ecology. And the fundamental feature about humans, which is we have this limpid consciousness, but we can also imagine what other people think. We can, we can put ourselves in their place, exactly like the two-year-old you describe who can, uh, doesn't, you know, closes their eyes and thinks you can't see them. But we can all do that, and that's the most remarkable thing about us. No other animal, as far as we know, People are trying to do things with gorillas. With chimpanzees and elephants and... No, no. For sure. No, it's different from being thinking you're in there. It's knowing what some... Having a theory of mind. Yeah. We can talk about the papers later on. The best they've got of videos of gorillas watching videos and trying to... With somebody in a gorilla suit trying to see where they are. No, so the, the, the science on that is, no, is, is a lot no, more advanced. No, I really disagree. That okay. is not true. Well, we'll have to hash okay, We'll have to argue about that later. Yeah. So but having a theory of mind. So where does that come from? That comes from our need, our cooperation, because humans are very cooperative, much more so than chimpanzees. So a chimpanzee society, uh, compared to a hunter-gatherer society, is very different in terms of the way it's organized. Much Human societies are much more cooperative and uh, egalitarian than most chimp societies are, and they're our closest relatives along with the bonobos. So one explanation of why we've got this consciousness is that it helps us organize our society, predict what others are going to do, imagine what will be the consequence of doing something bad to somebody else, he's going to come up and beat me up or whatever. And I think that is more likely an explanation than, uh, you know, 
chimps munching on strange mushrooms and having an yeah, insect. Yeah, these, these explanations are not incompatible with one another. I mean, certainly the evolution of the, the instinct to cooperate, for sure, is going to have a massive impact upon the kind of the divergent evolution of one species over another. Yeah, I guess all I'm saying is that if you have moments, I'm not going to go so far as to say that punctuated equilibrium, which is the explosion of species, is underwritten by something like this. But I think small moments along this greater path of our ability to care for one another, you know, is, is the right direction. Well, one thing that I, I find interesting, um, and I, I don't know about this evolved, but, but all, most or maybe all human societies pretty much you have found something, like it's usually rotting something, that they decided to eat, and it made them feel <laughs> groovy. And, and that's, that's a very human thing. Yeah. But then, the thing that I read, and it's on the internet, so I assume it's true. <laughs> so dolphins, yeah, yeah. They get these puffer fish, right? They have a toxin, and then they, they sort of sniff them and stuff, and then they pass them around. And it, it looks for all the world like, you know, they're like, hey, dude, here's the puffer fish. <laughs> and now dolphins yeah, do have absolutely. a complex social structure. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, anyways, whatever. Make what, make, yeah. yeah. We are <laughs> far from the only social animals. Dogs are very no, social. No, Wolves are, so, uh, and I'm all, so sorts, of, social, all yeah. sorts of monkeys and apes are extremely social. And those typically tend to be the ones that show more evidence, at least, of theory of mind and of sort of proto-moral dispositions as well. A sense of... Uh, of, of fairness, there's the famous capuchin monkey experiment um, that Franz de Waal and... Well, uh, yeah, so this is the one where you see the monkey working and it gets, uh, it, doesn't, it, gets a, it doesn't get a grape, it, it gets a piece of... Uh, it gets a piece cucumber. of... Uh, piece of cucumber. It throws yeah. it back. And yeah. what's interesting about that is that, of course, the monkey that's getting the grape is quite happy. It doesn't yeah. complain. Whereas if you're walking with your child and they see a beggar, your child says, why don't we give that beggar some money? You know, we've got lots, we want to share it. So humans are very different from those kind of animals in terms of so what in our that, in that are. In that example, yes, but then there's a lot of experiments with chimpanzees where they need each other to help open a yeah, box. That, yeah. And then they will cooperate and then they will give, even though they don't need to, they will give half of the yeah. whatever nuts to the other, to the other chimpanzee. No. Gentlemen, if you allow me, can we, can we resolve this <laughs> question? We'll fight later. Back to the, <laughs> mush the tripping. Uh, yes, in the after <laughs> body, we're going to have a sip of whiskey yeah. and we'll figure this one out. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a question uh, about uh, you know, the most certain plausibility that we'll destroy ourselves. So how are we going to do that? And the question is related to lasers again. Uh, is it possible that with a powerful enough razor we, uh, uh, laser we create a black hole or something of the sort? Um, not something like um, like a, a black hole, and kind of that would that would need an accumulation of a lot of mass very rapidly to create mm -hmm. an extreme gravitational field that could eat everything around it. But instead, on that level of thinking, the next generation of lasers, which the first of which has just been built and commissioned not far from here in Romania, as part of the Eli project, um, they have two. 10 petawatt lasers. Um, and each of those lasers, once they've got up and running, should be enough to start breaking the vacuum. So that's starting to explore the region of experimental quantum electrodynamics. So really exploring quantum physics experimentally and observing what we predict will come about when you do things like throw lasers into a vacuum chamber and see what comes out. So in terms of what I mean by breaking the vacuum, um, if you take a chamber and you suck all of the air out of it to create a vacuum, we tend to call a vacuum um, where there, is no, there are no particles, pretty much. It's em empty space. But in real life, it's not empty, empty space. It's a constant um, repetition of annihilation of matter and antimatter. So um, a a matter particle and an antimatter particle, they come together and they will annihilate into electromagnetic energy of some form, which is no longer has mass, but has energy without having mass. 
And so in the vacuum, that is constantly going on and on all the time. So when you look at it as a macro object and we observe it in our world, in our frame of reference, we don't see particles with mass because they're annihilating so quickly before we even have time to measure anything that has mass. Now, the idea of sending a 10 petawatt laser in there is that the laser intensity, the light intensity, the energy density is so extreme that it can accelerate those particles. Matter and antimatter have opposite charges. The, the light can get in there, the electromagnetic and quantum interaction can happen so uh, quickly that it can speed those particles away from each other before they have time to annihilate. So what you would observe, if quantum physics is correct, and you know that's not absolute certain, is that laser goes in, and what you measure is matter and antimatter, kind of proton, antiproton, electron, positron. So you see a spew of particles that appear to come from nowhere. And we've now, next door in Romania, have the lasers where we can start testing this for real. Um, and there. There is um, a project in China to build a 100 petawatt laser. I haven't even read the papers to find out what's expected or predicted to happen at that power level. Um, but you're really entering a regime where you're tickling the, the edges of quantum physics and, and exploring that paradigm. Right. Just one more question about the weaponization of lasers. You know, most of most of sure. people yeah, think about that now that you mentioned China, and of course, you know, uh, uh, Ratio and the Ratio crowd is essentially a bunch of nerds. So the question is, uh, how far are we from developing lightsabers? Of course. <laughs> I'm really glad you mentioned that because I have a, I have a thought you get about asked this that all yes. the time, and okay. I've thought about it a mm -hmm. lot. So my answer to this. And um, I can't remember which Star Wars it was. One of the last films, there was a scene where someone was talking about the lightsaber being um, the light sword or laser sword. And I got really annoyed. And I, was so, I wrote a whole Instagram post about it. Because <laughs> I don't think a lightsaber is a laser sword. I think it's a plasma sword. Right. And the reason I'll tell you that is because the way these weapons seem to work, so you press a button and this energy thing comes out, and this, it, it has a very finite stopping point, so it's confined, it has what seems to be a very high temperature, can slice things really easily, so it's very high temperature, it glows a specific colour, those are all the properties, to me, of a burning plasma blade, very high temperature, can be switched on very rapidly, glows a certain colour, very high temperature, can be um, confined to an element that has a certain length. So, so yeah, I would say a lightsaber is a plasma sword. Yeah. And, um, yeah, little plasma cells, little plasma cells are what you have inside plasma TVs. So, right. let's just, so, so yeah, if anyone would like to build one of those, then um, I'd love to document that, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question, uh, question for Sheena. I'm going to ask this question not because the, uh, uh, the answer is not obvious. I just like the way it's phrased. Uh, when we get a new lover <laughs> and we start living together, do we change our microbiome <laughs> because of the exchange? And let me extend that. I'm just going to add something. Can we speak about, um, you know, having, um, li like for example, if two people don't have uh, uh, microbiomes that are working in symbiosis very well, can mm. this actually affect mm. their relationship? Well, that's a really interesting really idea. Oh, microbial dating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Grinder for microbials. <laughs> Grinder for bugs. Yeah. Um, so studies um, have looked at this idea of um, genetics and environment for, for the microbiome, and particularly in, in mice, it's been really, really nicely done, and it, it's quite alarming, and it's probably one of the biggest flaws in the microbiome literature, is that you get enormous variation in cages. So different cages have different microbiomes. And so mice in one cage and mice in the cage next to it will have a different microbiome. And you can even track mums from the microbiome of mice. Uh, you know, so we've, we've had a look at that and just looked at some data and gone, okay, we can track the mum. And this is something that means that quite a lot of the mouse studies are almost certainly flawed because they don't report the environment of the microbes. So yeah, for sure, we definitely share a lot of microbes. And we did a, a study looking at wound healing 
and um, we were interested in a particular um, receptor that recognizes um, microbes on your skin and whether this was involved in sort of helping shape the microbial communities on your skin. And we noticed that you had a higher level of a particular type of bacteria called Pseudomonas arginosa. Now that is associated with problematic wounds that, that, that are infected and don't heal well. And certainly when you had more of this bacteria, although you were inherently normal, if you were wounded, you didn't heal well. But then when you mixed mice pups up, normal ones, with mice that had a lot of the Pseudomonas arginosa, the normal ones acquired the Pseudomonas arginosa, and then they didn't heal well. They didn't know how to heal their wounds. So yes, I do think we're probably all sharing those communities. That's 37 million bacteria we're aerosolizing and sharing. Right. Nice. So just, a, just a few more uh, very quick questions, and I will ask you for like blitz, uh, quick, quick answers. Okay. Uh, do we need to clean our toilets less often that we, than we usually do? <laughs> I'm asking that for personal reasons as well. <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's just being aware that that, that sparkly toilet um, so the initial flushes are going to introduce fecal bacteria. Now, the fecal bacteria doesn't survive well outside because most of your body is anaerobic. So it will gradually get replaced with skin bacteria like Staph epidermidis. Mm -hmm. So that is less inherently damaging to us than, say, C. diff, if you happen to be a shedder of C. diff. So just... Bear that in mind. So that freshly clean toilet will have more fecal bacteria in it than the slightly dirtier toilet. But, you know, it's a balance. All right. So does that mean the conventional, uh, conventional wisdom in raising kids is usually, you know, clean it up and et cetera, and now we learn more and more that we have to do exactly the opposite. So do you have any advice when it comes to that for all the parents in the room? Oh, I totally make my children wash their hands before they eat. Right. I don't want norovirus, and norovirus loves spreading on surfaces, <laughs> and it hangs around. So norovirus is the winter vomiting bug, and it aerosolizes when you vomit, and it goes all over lots of surfaces, and it stays on them for around 72 to 96 hours, which is why when you get an outbreak somewhere, it kind of spreads and spreads and spreads and spreads. So no, I'm totally for the washing hands before you eat, definitely. Sorry. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now speaking about health, we do have a question here um, regarding mental health and um, about you know, conventional psychotherapy that is being applied to different types of conditions. Now, uh, gentlemen, I'm, I'm, I'm more asking you guys, uh, what, do you, what do you think in general about psychotherapy and, and how does it compare with, with the new uh, ways to tackle mental disease like you know, different substances or cognitive therapy? What do you guys think? You guys ready to go? <laughs> uh, I'm happy to. So, Freudian psychoanalysis? Yes, I'm referring uh, more to, to the classical approach of healing. I mean, I think some, and I'm not an expert on this, but the approach can be, and this is also true with cognitive behavioral therapy, similar to what Greg was describing of trying to disrupt patterns. So you, you get into these destructive patterns and the goal is to disrupt those patterns. And in the Freudian case, it can be because of something in your childhood or because you want to have sex with your mother or because um, uh, whatever. In the cognitive behavioral therapy, they're really focused on just breaking these uh, destructive habits that you have and being aware of it and overcoming it through those means. So, I mean, and I know Freud is not in favor among psychologists now, or at least uh, many psychologists, because they worry about the falsifiability of his view. But he was surprisingly prophetic uh, about the degree to which we are not aware of um, or, or that, that our mental processes are not transparent to us in the way that we think. And so in that sense, um, I think it is very much in line with what you are trying to do with meditation, just using completely different methods. Right. I, I mean, I, I guess my own feeling, and I'm not yeah, that well-versed in it, that some of the constructs and theoretical sort of claims of the Freudian system I, I don't think have held up well. But the sort of therapeutic method of talking 
and trying to confront things in your psychology that you're hiding from yourself in general is a, is a good method. And I think there's some, some evidence that, you know, there's ways to do that that are more effective than others. I would sort of highly recommend for the field of psychology, you know, that, that the, the more testing they do, the more controlled testing they do, the better. And I think there was some resistance in the Freudian approach to that, which I don't think was a good thing. But, you know, anything that helps that we can test and figure out that really helps, good. And if, if, it's, if it involves, uh, you know, use of psychedelics in the right situations, great. But the cool thing that I think has happened is that there's been a somewhat of a sea change to allow psychedelics back in to the scientific conversation, which I think is very good. And certainly meditation as well. So, but controlled testing, you know, $400 an hour to a psychotherapist, I'd watch out. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll address it more from just the pure kind of pharmacological approaches because that's what I'm more familiar with. Uh, I was in a lab that studied SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake in inhibitors so like Prozac, uh, Effexor, Wellbut well, not Wellbutrin, but this sort of uh, class of drugs. Uh, and what they do is that they, they make serotonin more available at the synapse. That's sort of what's known. A lot more about the mechanism of their action is, is unknown. And some of the meta-studies that have come out, meta-study is like you look at all the papers that have been published on a topic and you're kind of doing statistics on them to see what the broad conclusions are. Um, that SSRIs are largely ineffective across the board for minor depression. In the cases of major depression, they, I mean, it's, this kind of thing is very frustrating because it's, it's very kind of individual dependent. I mean, if, if we're going to consider the microbiome as having some impact on our mental health, which it does, um, then, I mean, that's just one example of the many ways in which somebody's brain is going to be different than another person. So some people are profoundly helped by SSRIs. Many people are not. The thing which happens is that they group all those people together and they give you an effect size, which oftentimes is like 15% of the patients feel, uh, you know, relief in their major depressive episode. Psychedelics are more like 80%. I mean, when you're, like, coming from pharmacology, it's very, very rare to see a substance have that degree of an effect. I mean, them having been illegal for 40 years is really a travesty, I think, from the perspective of history, but there's so much potential in these drugs to, for example, ameliorate the existential fear of death. Like, in this Johns Hopkins study, they had given um, terminal cancer patients who were, you know, within a year of dying as their prognosis, high doses of psilocybin, and some massive percentage of it, I don't remember what it was, but it was definitely over 50% of them came out of the study having lost their fear of death. There is nothing <laughs> for them that I can think of that would be able to supplant that. And again, I don't know a lot about kind of discussive therapy, you know, from a uh, psycho like psychology point of view, but uh, anyway, psychedelics have a, a lot of promise. Right. Okay. You love psychedelics. That's <laughs> my I mean, anyway. Can you yeah, I'm just fan. like heavy turning into this guy. <laughs> yeah, no, they're but, great. But. I mean, they they definitely work. And you know, one thing I wanted to say before is that there's there's a human, not just a human. There there's like an evolutionary drive to consume this type of a substance. You know, plants. You if you think about it this way, have evolved the, and they they could use it for a lot of internal processes which have nothing to do with manipulating our brains, but certainly there are parasites which produce specific chemicals or interact with our biology in such a way to, to make us do certain behaviors. Uh, certain parasites, for example, that ca are in cat poop cause r that rats eat cause rats to lose their anxiety and run through the middle of the floor so that the rat can eat them. You know? So if there are plants which are c creating these substances that are have a, like a positive effect on our lives, we have this innate desire to change our consciousness. And you know, this may be one of the ways in which it's manifesting, that it's inherently beneficial to us. Right. I okay. want to pick up on the, the toxoplasma story there. So the, the, the studies have in rodents have suggested that there could be changes in inherent fear, and it could be to do with changes in, in neurotransmitters or changes in the uh, biochemistry of the brain because you're having an immune response in the brain. And that's beneficial to the parasite because the parasite can only sexually replicate in a cat. This is a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. However, in humans, this is a lot more up for debate. And I think it's, it's really important because a lot of the studies that have suggested that Toxoplasma changes behavior in, in humans are, again, they're correlative studies. 
and they use markers like levels of antibody to suggest that that means you've got more or less of the parasite. And then they start doing really arbitrary stats where they go, you've got a high level of antibody, therefore we think you've got a high level of parasite, therefore you're doing this. So they even subdivide people, whereas the level of antibody has nothing to do with the level of parasite in your brain. And the biggest ever study was done in Australia where they actually longitudinally tracked people for 20 years and they found no evidence that there was changes in behaviour with Toxoplasma gondii, which I think is good news because it's the parasite that I think frightens a lot of people. And we do have a different immune response to the mice. We're not cat food, by and large. <laughs> so the parasite yeah. doesn't need to adapt our brain. And we know that the immune response of mice is very tightly evolved to deal with these parasites. Yeah, well, I guess that, that's really my, my general point is that certain species relationships have evolved this kind of yeah. very intimate interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. A couple of quick questions uh, to you, Matthew. Uh, panspermia, first, what do you think that life uh, you know, came out uh, through a comet you know, from, from, from somewhere else? And the possibility of existence of a silicon-based uh, life form? So the idea of panspermia, I mean, we'll know when we get to Mars. And if we find uh, on Mars uh, bacteria that are alive and look like our species, our, our type of life, then that would indicate that a form of panspermia might have taken place because there are earth rocks on Mars. Because when an asteroid hits Earth, then bits of rock get flown up into, thrown up into space and the bacteria can resist uh, interplanetary uh, vacuum and may well then have colonized Mars. Or the opposite could have happened. We might be Martians. Yeah, it is possible that life began on Mars in the, that when it was nice and then as it began to dry up, you know, asteroids hit and a rock came and fell in the ocean and left its trace uh, in us. I think that's pretty unlikely, but it's possible. So in either case, it doesn't actually solve anything. Mm. <laughs> it just puts it back to uh, a, you know, a galaxy far, far away and doesn't necessarily help us in understanding how life occurred, which we don't properly understand how it evolved. But I think most people assume that panspermia is not an explanation, but we'll find out when we find, if we ever do, another form of life. If it has got DNA and it's very similar to us, then I think that would be a very strong argument in favor of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Silicon life forms? Uh, well, we use uh, water and carbon, and that's the essential elements that are involved in us uh, being able to, to exist. So the theory is that silicon can form similar kind of structures. It's got a relatively inert structure to carbon. I think one of the big arguments against it is there's nowhere near as much of it about. So carbon is absolutely everywhere, which is one reason why I don't think we need to worry about being eaten. If you had a space civilization, you could just hoover up carbon from all over the place. But there's much less silicon about, and it's relatively rare in the Earth's crust. And there was less of it about when the uh, solar system was being formed. So there's a kind of abundance argument that suggests that maybe carbon's quite easy to make stuff out of uh, because there's a lot of it and silicon less so. But mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. Okay. We have an interesting question here uh, related to the perception of self again. Now having in mind uh, the biological reality of the human body that we live in symbiosis with you know, billions of bacteria even inside our cells. We have an external organism that we evolved with the mitochondria. Does it make more sense to speak about ourselves as we <laughs> <laughs> rather than I? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean that would just raise a whole host of different confusions I think. I mean there is a sense in which we are different people over the course of our lives. We are different um, people over the course of a day. Um, and there's different sides of me. But if I start, you, our, our, our language doesn't reflect that conception of we. And so I think it would be the, an improper use of language, even if there is some sense in which it's correct. It's more correct. It's more accurate. And the, the, I mean, there's a sense in which what we are is, is a very, very complex colony of, of bacteria that shares, you know, you, you carry, you know, they're, they're multicellular, you carry it, where we are we. But then there's a sort of single control system that's evolved on top of it. And that's the thing that does the talking 
and I guess the thinking. Um, and so, you know, yeah, they're the, sort of the, you know, the way we refer to each other, the way we interact. I, you know, you're a whole group of things, but, you know, I, I talk to Tamler, and so you've got a name, and, you know, so I don't think calling us we would be helpful for our social interactions, but we are a we. I think we are. I think we're a very complex, you know, colony of bacteria that gets together to do stuff. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's interesting what you mentioned, but can, can we speak about uh, bacteria that are actually affecting our behavior? So when you speak about the central thing that controls everything, does it, though? <laughs> I, th I think this idea yeah. of the gut-brain axis is really interesting. It's not, not my, my speciality, but um, the, even the degree to which um, you know, we, we on, on understand that we feel hunger or we feel full, that's a relationship between gut hormones and the brain and sort of two-way signaling. So I guess the extension, therefore, that, that the microbes are producing products that can also you know, get to our neurons and signal is, is appealing and I think you know there is some evidence for that and it, I think it's an interesting area who, but I, I, I don't know if there's any one bacteria that we know that has one particular job there apart from maybe that probiotic that was put in those mice in that initial study I, because again they work in communities so we've got a lot to learn. But it's pretty clear that we're not always in control and a lot of the time that we think the cause of our action is one thing and it turns out to be something completely different and we do a lot of post hoc rationalizing of our decisions in this and we think oh this is why I made that decision and you see this in split brain patients where they will not because they don't the one side of their brain doesn't have access to the other side of their brain they will they can get signals that they don't have conscious awareness of and so if you tell them to leave the room, they won't know that they saw that, um, that signal. And so they'll get up and leave the room. They come back and they say, why'd you just leave? What are you doing? And they'll say, oh, I had to go to the bathroom. Or I had to, so it's just not transparent to us why we do the things we do a lot of the time and maybe the majority of the time. I, I think it's also, the very starting point about the, the self being the homunculus, that the impression that we have yeah. of looking out and being in our heads, that, that's quite a modern invention, and most cultures don't think that. And most cultures have previously thought that we've, we're somewhere else, uh, in our kidneys, or most often in, in our hearts. I mean, in English, yeah. and I'm sure in Bulgarian, you've got exa all these phrases about, you know, he's down at heart, you've got your heart on your sleeve, and there have been studies asking people, where do you feel emotions? And it's not up here, it's in your guts, it's in your heart, and that's our experience. That, as you said earlier on, the brain has a body. We're not, we're not this disembodied thing. We're part of our body and part of our microbes but, as well. But maybe the gut feeling is, is, is more real than we realize. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Ab no, it's very, it is. You know, that's, if you feel, I feel scared, it's down here, it's not up here, you know. Yeah. Mm. Greg, you want to say something about that, Tom? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Follow That's your surprise. gut. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Follow your gut. Um, to those of you who meditate for, 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 for the obvious reasons that you just stated in your, uh, in, in your previous discussion, can you share your meditation practices? Uh, I mean, what is your favorite yeah. way to actually get to that state? So mine is, I do mindfulness practice. I do it about somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes a day. And I started about three and a half years ago. And I'm pretty good about, I mean, I think the key with meditation, I think a lot of people have started it, and this is true of me, I started it many times before it stuck. You really have to develop the habit. And the, the style of meditation that I do is called Vipassana. It is very much about not thinking about what your goal is or trying to uh, demolish your sense of self. It's just doing the meditation. They have practices, they have exercises. And so it's like scales, you know, playing scales on the piano. You don't have to know why you're playing scales, but you're developing certain skills that once they're in place and once those habits are in place will allow you to um, like experience the world differently. And I. You know, I also think sometimes the claims of meditation are overinflated, and so people get frustrated. Well, I've been meditating for six months, and I'm not happier, and I, do, I still <laughs> think I'm me, and I uh, still get stressed out. And so I think you have to go in with tempered expectations. It's not going to completely transform 
your way of understanding yourself or it's not going to make you uh, ecstatic, uh, you know, in, except in very rare cases, it is just going to make life a little better, make you a little more aware of what's going on around you, a little less in your head, like obsessing over what I said at this, you know, at this conference or <laughs> what I'm going to say at the next conference, but actually focused on what's right here, right now. And that's the best thing about it from my perspective. Right. Josh? I, wanna show. Um, I don't practice. You oh, well, don't practice it. That's not quite true. I, I play the guitar and what I, I learned to do at some point was to, to, to really do something very simple, so like scales, and to just listen to it and, and, and not let other things get in my head. And it's hard. It was, and, and, but it, when I am able to do it, it's, I find it very re relaxing, clears my head. Right. So, but it not, not, I'm not more developed like, like Tim or Josh? Greg. Greg. Do, you, uh, do you take anything? <laughs> <laughs> do you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's what. I, um, yeah, I mean, I do something similar to Vipassana muta uh, mutation. Mm -hmm. Mutation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> mutation. Um, it's like focusing on the breath, you know, you, you, you kind of become aware of it which sounds like a very simple practice, and it is, and it becomes weirdly like the most complex thing like, as you're trying to do it because your mind in you trying to relax it just invents all these crazy games that it's trying to play, mm -hmm. um, and you just keep bringing it back to the breath and, mm -hmm. and just filter out these thoughts that are just coming you know, inevitably. I use the float tank. I ha I've been med meditating much less since my children have been born. I haven't had as much time, even though I'm in more need of it now. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, and I do uh, breathing exercises They're called pranayamas, which the, the idea is that the, the state of the brain is linked to the state of the breath and by slowing down or by directly manipulating your breath that you can kind of shift your brain into more concentrated states. Uh, and so that's part of the practice uh, right. as well as the kind of attention to breathing. Okay. Do you guys want to share anything if you, you, or, or you don't practice that? I it do like a bit. A I think mm -hmm. I do the breathing and mm -hmm. the, the thing that Greg was talking about, but I'm not, I'm, it's like you say, you need to keep practicing because mm -hmm. my brain goes and flips around and then I go get grumpy with it. So yeah, I think you do need to focus at it, but I do feel better when I have phases of doing it. So I should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that everybody's brain runs away. It happens to absolutely everybody. And almost everybody in this room would probably say, oh, I can't meditate because my brain is constantly running away. It's just, it happens. It's fine. Yeah. It's totally fine. You just, yeah. You're not yeah, failing yeah. if yeah. that's happening. You're, mm. in fact, you're succeeding in one sense because you're noticing it. Yeah. And m most of the time, we don't even notice that our brain is running away from us. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay. I think we're out of time now. Ob obviously, you know, we had so many questions, and one hour is not nearly enough uh, to cover to cover everything. But I would suggest. Uh, to the audience is that you guys come to the after party, just buy them a beer <laughs> and <laughs> ask them whatever, wh whatever you want. Uh, they're probably much more fun as well when if, if they're drunk <laughs> with, I don't know. Uh, Never anyways. mind mushrooms if anybody yeah, yeah. Never mind mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who well, knows the guy? Makes you think yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not drunk right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I want to uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, for your talks and and for participating in this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Please, your applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.